Welcome to the Carveline Tech Service Podcast, the go-to industrial coatings podcast. Here are your hosts, Jack Walker and Paula Jamis. Be sure to hit like, subscribe, and set your notifications to on so you never miss any important YouTube content from Carveline. All right, here we are again on another edition of the Carboline Tech Service Podcast. I'm Jack Walker. Over to my left or your right or, you know, somewhere on the screen is Paula Jamis. Hey, we'll Paul. figure out this video thing and what's backwards and forwards eventually, I guess. Yeah, I think we should go ahead and uh, bring in Brian Cheshire, who's uh, down below. He's comes on the show. Hey, Brian, how's it going? Hey, guys, doing well. How are you guys? It's going really you know, well. I'm not ready for this. <laughs> Everybody should know that I am not a grown up and that I do not have enough uh, skills. Uh, we, we decided to make this really hard on ourselves for the second episode that we did on video because uh, who wants to tell them what we're going to talk about today? Okay, I will. I can, I can say the first part with a straight face. Today, we're going to talk with Brian about manhole restoration. There we go. Wastewater collection systems as it forever shall be known from here on out. There you go. <laughs> the, what makes it the most difficult is doing this on video. We get much less editing ability. Yeah. You know, if when it was just audio, you could cut out all the jokes and everything that we wanted. But uh, this will be a little more difficult. Totally. So anyway, let's. Let's get into it. And Brian, why don't we talk a little bit about manholes and uh, how we coat them and, you know, just kind of the basic intro stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, t talking about manholes, it's part of the collection system. You know, so, so when we talk about collection systems, you know, we're, we're talking manholes, lift stations, force mains, even like your transmission and conveyance. Um, but, but, why this is such a hot but hot button topic, why it's so important. Um, you know, we talk about, we've talked about this on the show before, but it's pretty well known that the American Society of Civil Engineers puts out infrastructure report cards every several years. And in 2017, they put out a report card basically grading our wastewater infrastructure as a D plus. And so, um, you know, the, the fact is manholes are, are, are a portion of that. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're used really in sewage and stormwater applications. Um, they provide service workers with access to the systems, you know, during their maintenance and repair operations. Um, the thing is, you know, a lot of these manholes um, are past their design life, really. I mean, and they're made of materials, anything from brick to other masonry type materials. Um, and the thing is, I mean, there's Roughly, you know, I've seen this number kind of vary, but, you know, roughly 22 to 24 million manholes in the U.S. And of that, you can break down about 4 million or about 50 years old. And then another 5 million or 30 to 50 years old. And so, you know, a lot of times the typical design life of these is 50 years at the most. And, you know, the fact is they're in a very corrosive environment. You know, they, they have to hold up to a lot. Um, and one of the things, you know, once again, we've talked about on here before is biogenic sulfide corrosion. And in these, it attacks the, the cement, the Portland cement paste in the concrete. And then also in these brick structures, you see issues with, with the mortar, with the, with the grout over time. And so the importance of rehabilitating these is, you know, in a lot of cases, it's going to be cheaper to re to re you know, rehab or repair these than to replace the manhole altogether. So I guess that was the question I was going to lead into is what is the, what is the real reason for wanting to do or needing to do this restoration of this collection basin system? I see yeah. what you did there. I did. Yeah. I was, I was proud of everybody. We made it through the first segment and, and kept it in, pulled it through. Mm -mm. No, yeah. not going to happen. <laughs> Hey, I, I think it's appropriate, you know, maybe I insert a palate cleanser here and, and, and ask a philosophical question, you know, kind of before we get into the next point. But I want to ask you guys, you know, what do you do if a woman pushes you into a manhole? I'm not touching it. Not touching that one? No. <laughs> well, my, my, my dad jokes reference book tells me that you sue her. <laughs> 
That's all you got. But you stopped the whole show for that. Let's keep going. <laughs> Like I said, palate cleanser. I got, I got to get this thing back on track somehow. <laughs> All right, so so why the need for manhole rehabilitation? You know, let's get this back on track here. Um, one of the one of the big things, one of the big issues that you see is you hear it referred to as I and I, which is inflow and infiltration, and big problem in collection systems. And manholes account for about fifty percent of an overall system's I and I. Um, but the difference between them, um, when you talk inflow, this is really where the rainwater enters through the sanitary sewer, you know, through, through holes in the covers, um, catch basins, or even you know, improper connections. Uh, infiltration is a little different. It's where groundwater seeps into the sanitary sewer uh, you know, manhole through cracks or joints. And so, uh, Looking at different studies, you hear manholes referred to as the low-hanging fruit of infrastructure rehab. And the reason for that statement, I guess, is, is number one, the accessibility, and then also uh, the fact that these do account for such a significant amount of a system's I&I. &I. And really the bad thing about I&I &I is, you know, if, if you're getting more, more of that in your system, uh, you can potentially overload your treatment plants and drive your cost up because naturally, you know, the cost of treating um, wastewater, you've now added to that volume through allowing, you know, this stuff to get into your system. So, sure. And I'm sure if any of, if any of you, I know I do, I live in an older neighborhood and we've recently had our wastewater system uh, representatives come through as engineering firms came through you know, inspected, they did soundings on our gutters and they kind of traced our, our, our house runoff areas just to make sure that we weren't artificially adding to the volume that needed to be treated. You know, the roof runoff didn't need to be put into the same as the, the sanitary sewer, the septic sewers. They had to be, you know, they wanted them separate. Definitely. So I guess that gets us to the next part of to also barely scraping by. I don't know if you can, t you can't tell in the audio version. But uh, what are some of the different methods of rehabilitation for these systems? Yeah, so, so you really see those broken out into a few general categories. Um, the first being um, your cementitious type products. Um, and you can really look first at your uh, micro silica enhanced mortars, and then even some of your reinforced Portland cement based uh, repair mortars. And the fact is, I mean, when, when you're having to bring a, a manhole back up to plane um, and get it to where, um, you know, naturally it, it can hold up better to the conditions, um, this is a very cost effective method. You know, it, with micro silicas, you can uh, sometimes use these as a standalone rehab, you know, especially in mild H2S conditions. Um, but a lot of times, too, you'll see these types of mortars. Uh, used as a, what's called a composite system where you see them top coated with usually an epoxy um, to kind of add to that that protection. Um, but, but kind of staying on that same vein, talking about uh, cementitious, um, the next being uh, calcium aluminum mortars. And so while these can be top coated as well, these are generally used as standalone for moderate H2S conditions. And these actually give you a little more chemical resistance than, than what a standard micro silica would. Um, and then you can, you can clump in, you know, so there's some other technologies, geo, geopolymers, not necessarily cementitious, but it kind of falls in that same family to a degree. Uh, that's a, a newer technology. Um, but also, you know, you see uh, cured in place composites used. Um, and the thing is, they, these aren't necessarily cost effective in every situation. And also, you know, they're going to require the manhole to be at least three foot in diameter. And sometimes to install these um, CIPP methods, you've got to remove the chimney of the manhole in order to, to get into the larger diameter at the bottom. And so, you know, kind of echoing that point, you know, sometimes cost can, you know, eliminate that, that particular method. But on top of that, you see fiberglass, PVC inserts, drop-in liners. I mean, th th there's really a lot of different ways um, to, to skin this cat, basically. 
All right, Paul, we are going to talk a little bit about the Simstone System Selector Guide. This is a brand new document brought to you by Carboline to help you better navigate our secondary containment line. Paul, why don't you tell them a little bit about this guide? Yeah, so one of the really nice things about this guide is just how interactive it is. This guide goes and breaks down on dozens and dozens of different common chemicals that you're going to see in the industrial spaces. And it lets you know, are you talking about foot traffic? Do you have forklift traffic? Is this a truck loading zone? And it breaks down each system by what kind of traffic can it tolerate? What kind of system do you have to install? And the interactive part is when you go to the website and you go to the marketing page and you download this document, it's interactive to the point where you click on the button and it opens up the system information sheet for that product. So it will tell you about the full aggregate filled coating system or a neat coat system if it's a neat or a fabric reinforced system. Every one of those are linked right there to it. So there's no guessing. There's no hunting around. You don't have to know how to maneuver the website. Just click on that and it takes you right to the sheet that gives a description of what coatings are needed and how to order and generally install that system. Yeah. So if you're a specifier and you're out there and you're working on secondary containment systems, you should use this guide as it'll give you everything you need to know to write a secondary containment specification. That's the Simstone Selector Guide by Carboline at www.carboline.com. So when we look at these whole systems and, and how do we choose which one that we're going to choose, um, you know, what kind of lining material, what kind of repair material, what are some of the performance testings that we use to be able to pick the right systems? Yeah, so... Um... So really talking about, you know, protective coatings as a means of, of rehabbing manhole structures, you know, there's some very specific tests that really aim to duplicate the aggressive conditions in the, in the manhole. Um, the first of which is uh, ASTM G210. It's a, it's a fairly newer standard, um, really been introduced in the last decade. Uh, what that stands for is severe wastewater analysis testing. And, you know, it, it's trying to basically within this, this apparatus, um, you're testing specimens and, and the whole aim of the apparatus is really to simulate what it's like in a sewer headspace. And so within that, there's a, a liquid phase and a vapor phase. Um, and then there's elevated temperatures, but um, just to kind of give you a, give you a glimpse. I mean, your, your specimens are having to hold up to, you know, 10% sulfuric acid on the liquid side. And then on the sewer gas side, um, they're testing it in elevated temperatures with hydrogen sulfide gas, carbon dioxide gas, and methane. Um, so that that's one that we've seen a lot in the last last decade, kind of kind of rise to to arise, I guess, in its use. Um, the other is an older test. Um, it was developed in LA County, or excuse me, the city of LA uh, for their sewer system. Um, it's, and it's called the Green Book Chemical Resistance Test. Mm -hmm. No, come people, on. Now, really, what's it being called? That's right. I was going to say, mo most people know it as the pickle jar test. That's right. And so, that you know, this is used really as a threshold test for any new material that's proposed for use in L.A. public sewers. But you've seen this standard used in other municipalities because it is a pretty stringent test. And um, what this one does is, is you take specimens, expose them to a, I mean, some, some very aggressive chemicals and at some very high concentrations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you basically analyze it um, with, the, with the change in weight um, after the exposure to kind of get an idea of a pass fail. Man, you guys are trying to just trip me up talking about pickle jars while we're talking about manholes. It's not fair. <laughs> it's not okay. So I think uh, lastly, the last thing that we need to touch on here is that we need to touch on the different types of coatings that we could use. I, I think we've had you on enough times and we've talked about the pros and cons enough. Let's just kind of uh, talk about the different kinds of coatings that we would use uh, to restore a uh, old manhole. Yeah. So, um, you know, just generic resin types, you know, epoxies, especially amine epoxies. Um, and, and typically these are, you know, 100% solids, usually reinforced materials. Um, but you see those used quite a bit. Um, and I would say those are probably the most widely used. Um, in addition, well, I actually stay in on the, the, that same topic. Um, you'll see spray applied, but you also see um, 
aggregate field epoxy is used as well, which, you know, um, you can apply in, sometimes in greater thicknesses and then they give you you know, some different application um, characteristics there. But, um, but in addition to those, you know, you also see, you know, aromatic polyurethane linings. Uh, you also see polyureas used um, in, in certain instances. Well, that's great. I think that about does it for us this week on the Carboline Tech Service podcast. I think we made it. Uh, I think Dwayne will be able to leave my corner here. Do we, do we get to give a round of applause for ourselves for getting through that topic? Is I that... mean, maybe a little bit. I was going to push the button, but again, I don't know which one's the right one. And I can't hear it. Can you hear it? That's the theme song. Oh, it's yeah. I give up. Yeah. So, uh, for Paul over there, for Brian down there, I'm Jack, and uh, thanks for sticking with, uh, sticking with us this week. <laughs> <laughs>